Well, there's a red circle. Usually it means things are being reported. So welcome to the first class uh, in this course, the first practical assignment. Uh, today we will cover the subject, not the discipline. Today we will discuss the client-server architecture and its implications. You were probably exposed to this term in the past. Maybe you have some things to share what it means or what it might mean. Well, I mean, clients are clients, and we've probably heard things such as the client is always right. So you definitely have to know something about the clients. Uh, what about servers? Has anyone ever seen a server? What was it? A box with a label server on it? So what was it? Running uh -huh. So this is a machine. What kind of a machine? Was it big? Was it small? Or did it make a difference? So there are several aspects. On one hand, the server is a machine that serves, that does something for us. But on the other hand, it is also a piece of software that serves a specific function. Um, and that's an after thing. So if I ever ask you if you've seen a server, you may just as well say, no, I have never seen one, because it's a non-material thing. So this class will be about the software side of servers, and of course, clients. And in any case, once you have the software, you can make it run on pretty much any platform. It could be a huge box in a big data center. It could be a small computer such as this one. It could be a laptop, or it could even be a mobile phone, which is the size of my hand, really tiny, but it still serves as a server. Um, is there anything you would like to ask at this point? What kind of servers are there? How do we program them? Or if there are no questions, then I move on. One basic question since this is a network programming course, is how do we make this happen? And the answer is that we rely on the BSD Sockets API. A socket is a network primitive that we use to send and receive stuff. An API means application programming interface. This is a list of functions that we can call in order to achieve some state or objective. And BSD, uh, in this case, it refers to the Berkeley Sockets uh, distribution. Wait a second. Berkeley software, software distribution. Yeah. <coughs> so this is a university where they you know, figured out many years ago that it would be a good idea to try and make computers talk to each other. So they thought about it and they devised an API. This API was distributed under the BSD license, which has, that's where the name Berkeley Software Distribution comes from. And it's an open source license that implies that you can use this software for any purpose, even if it's commercial. And if you want, you can give the updated source code back, or you can just keep it to yourself. So this is one of the things that made this API really, really popular. People used it even though they weren't sure they would grow a commercial product out of it or it would be something else, which is open source. This was a safe bet. And this might be one of the things that made it so widespread. So this API has a bunch of functions. Uh, one of them, 
So we have two sites, the client and the server. That's the server, and this is the client. The client connects to a server, and once the connection is established, you can exchange data, send more data back, and so on. So how do we do that? Using the Circuits API. There are several primitive functions that you need to understand in order to be able to devise your own protocols, implement other protocols, and then set up your own server. And there are not that many of them. Uh, I will start with the client side because it's a little bit more simple. So there is a function called connect, which takes an address and the input. And the address is a data structure that has several components. One of them is an IP address. And the other one is the port number. The port number is a figure that varies between 0 and 65,535. Uh, you should always question such things as magic numbers. Why is it 65535 rather than 666 or 1984? Any guesses? It's a power of <coughs> or minus one. Because yes. in final system. So this maximum. happens to be to the power of 16. And zero is also a number. So that's why he, he said blah, 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 minus one. Um, zero is usually reserved for some special purposes. We'll come to it sometime later. So, yeah, this is the connect function. <coughs> There's another one called send, which allows you to send some data <coughs> to the peer to which you are connected. So let's just say sending some data. Oh, and by the way, uh, all this stuff, I'm running it from memory. If you read the documentation, maybe this one is not called address, but target address, or just target, or destination. You know, it's not really super accurate, but when we switch to the practical part, we'll implement it in real time. So we'll see whether I remember things accurately or not. Uh, then there is another function called receive. Usually, you give it a number that indicates the amount of bytes that you are ready to accept. Let's say 12. We give it a variable called buffer size. And this thing returns you a data. The send function also returns something. Usually, it returns the number of bytes that were successfully written into the socket. In other words, the number of bytes that were successfully sent to the other side. Uh, so, bytes written. Connect, send, receive. It sounds reasonable that there ought to be a function called disconnect or close or shut down or something of that sort. And its name is, I think it's close. And doesn't take anything at the input. Um, besides these four, there should be another one, which is a constructor of your socket object. You have to get started somehow. And that one is called socket. It has a bunch of arguments. And depending on the API implementation, it may or may not take those arguments um, in a mandatory fashion. In other words, for example, in Python, you could just write socket with nothing in the braces, and it works. In other languages, you might have to say uh, what kind of socket you want. So I will write 
write it down as follows. I start with I. Since we haven't yet discussed that in the other class, it's probably premature to discuss what you should write when you call this function. But it will all come to you in just a few minutes. So this constructor gives you a socket object at the output. So that's about it. Uh, what are your questions so far? Is it all clear? In that case, we move on. The server has the same set of functions plus a few additional ones. Um, first of all, you have to create the socket as well. You need a socket object. So once you instantiate it, uh, you have to call a function called bind. And specify the interface to which the socket is bound. An interface, in this case, is a network interface. And in simple terms, uh, you have to somehow tell it which network card to use for accepting those connections. So we'll get to that part. Once the socket is bound, uh, if this function runs correctly, then there will be no exception thrown, so you can move on. Another function from the API is called listen. takes an argument which indicates the size of a cube. And I'll cover that in just a few moments. Another function that servers have and clients don't is a function called accept. It doesn't take anything at the input. And this one returns client socket. So when the client calls the connect function here, the server, the server's call to accept finally returns a value. And that value is a socket object which is associated with this connection that the client has just established. And from that point on, you can use this socket object with the same functions, send and receive to exchange data with the client. And keep in mind that there is this original socket. I'm going to call it the, the listening socket, which is one thing, and the client socket, which is another one. So there are two different objects. Once the server's accept function has returned, and you have this socket in your hands, you can call this function again to accept another connection from another client. So you could run this one in some sort of infinite loop, and your server would be able to accept multiple connections from different clients. And this one has a close function too. Now let me tell you a few more things about interfaces. A network interface usually you recognize it because it looks like an IP address and the most uh, widespread interface that we'll be using throughout our experiments is the local host interface which is 127001. If you have your computers in front of you right now you could write ping this and it will reply even if your computer is not connected to an actual network. In fact the entire 1 to 7 dot whatever range is mapped to your local host. So you could do something like ping 1 to 7, 1 to 45, and it will still reply. And another interesting thing is that depending on your operating system flavor, you could even write something like ping 1 to 7 dot 1, and it will still reply, even though this doesn't look like an actual IP address. 
make sure computers are turned on. Since we don't have, well, yeah, we do. same stuff again. So on one line we have the client, on the other we have the server. And there is something important that I have to emphasize. So when the client connects, when you call the connect function, let's say I'm connecting to port 80, which is a regular port used by HTTP servers. When I call the connect function, the network modules in my operating system will choose a port in somewhere in this range which is currently not in use and allocate it to this socket and it would be a random number that it will. so let's say it's this one a connection is established and remember that the accept function gives you a new socket object so when this connection is established, you don't actually keep talking to the same socket that has accepted your connection. It's going to be another one. So somewhere, if, you, if, if this thing is three-dimensional, then if you look behind this line, there would be another socket to which you actually are connected. And you can view those connections using a tool called NetStat. It is available on Linux and on Windows and on Macs as well. You can run it with arguments such as minus A, it means show me all the connections, and minus M, which shows you the port numbers as numbers instead of such words. For example, it would show you 80 instead of showing HTTP. That will be one for now. So if you if you run this command, you will get a long list of stuff. And that will show you all the current connections that your system is dealing with, as well as their state. And by state, I mean something like um, waiting connected disconnecting etc connection established and so on so did anyone give it a try did you see something like that uh -huh. okay so it's waiting for something uh, by looking at the port number uh, there is actually another argument I think it's minus p but I'm not sure uh, but you can, of course, find it in the manual. It will tell you the ID of the process which is responsible for that socket. So you could see who the owner is, and based on that, you could guess what that connection is about. It's waiting for an incoming email or for an incoming HTTP request, etc. In our practical assignments, well, at least in the first one, uh, you will have to implement a client and a server, two components, one and the other. Since this is your first exposure to computer networks, getting it done right might be tricky. Uh, that's why it probably might be a good idea uh, to write the server first and use Telnet as a client. Because Telnet 
does exactly that. You give it, uh, so when you run telnet, you say something like this. Telnet IP address, let's say it's 127001, and then a port number, like 80. And when you do this, the server accepts the connection, and once the connection is established, whatever you type in the telnet window is sent to the server using the send function. And whenever the server sends you something, telnet automatically receives it and prints it for you on the screen. So the point is that, um, let's say you, you implemented your own client and your own server, but something doesn't work. And obviously, it could be a problem here or on the other end. But if you use telnet instead of your own client, then if something doesn't work, it's very unlikely that it's a bug in telnet. It's most likely somewhere in there. Probably. So that's why our first steps will be uh, with telnet and the custom written server. So I think this is a is a is an introduction that gives us enough info to get started with the practical stuff. But before we do, what are your questions? Yeah? I have three questions. Go ahead. Um, first of all, what does a client look like? You mean in terms of source code or no, in terms of what the client does a client look like? What your client has to do once you're completed? Yeah. So the first assignment will cons consists from the following objectives. So first of all, you have to devise your own protocol, a set of commands, which you can send to the server and get a response. So the client has to implement that protocol. Is this the kind of answer you were expecting? Okay, that's our next question. Uh, second, doesn't the listen function on the, on the server take a port number? I'm mean, not sure. When you bind it, you give it the interface, which is the tuple of the form IP address and port number. We can double check that shortly when we get to the. And uh, uh -huh. can we use JavaScript for the server implementation? This is a tricky question. First of all, my only exposure to JavaScript is some sort of psychological trauma. I had to do this, so that's why I did it. I am not sure whether JavaScript gives you the BSD sockets API. Because as far as I understand, it's supposed to be running within a sandboxed browser. And if you are able to establish arbitrary connections to anyone or accept connections, then this could, could hypothetically mean that somebody who opens your website also retrieve the JavaScript, which is then called through the HTML code, and your server will do nasty things, which it wasn't expected to do. But since I'm not a JavaScript guru, I wouldn't bet my life on that. I know that um, there is one more thing. So when you call the bind function, and you set it to a port number between uh, 0 and 1024. This is a specially designated range that is managed by an entity called IAMA, Assigned Internet Authority for Number Assignments, I think, or something like that. Um, on pretty much any decent operating system, when you try to bind your listening socket, to a port in this range, you will be requested admin rights. So I am pretty positive that the browser executing JavaScript code shouldn't be having admin rights because this gives you too much power to do nasty things. That's why I am inclined to answer your question negative. But we can give it a try and, and figure it out together. What are your other questions? Which operating system is better? The one you know the best. 
what are your other questions? Well, if there are no questions, then I'm going to connect my computer and we get started.